Greetings. This uh, commentary, and I guess you could sort of call it a Bible study, is going to be entitled Identity Theft. Identity Theft. Everybody that's been watching the news lately is familiar with that term. That's where somebody gets your personal information, steals your identity, runs up credit charges in your name. So, just a little while ago, one of the three major credit bureaus, there's three major credit bureaus. I think one of them is Experian, the other is TransUnion, and I don't remember what the other one is. But they maintain records and decide if you are a good credit risk or not based upon your payment history and how much money you owe and how much money you make. And I mean, they know uh, they know basically everything about you. And I'm sure the government, um, the IRS, and everybody else shares this information with them. After all, these people are the banks. They don't work for the banks. They are the banks. You know, the banks set up this, these, these credit union, oh, I mean, these credit people. Now, I'm not sure. I think it was Experian reported a computer hack, a data breach, where, I don't know the exact number, I think it was like 130, 140 million Americans had their personal information that's stored on the computers of this credit bureau stolen. Do you realize that's about 40% of all the people in the United States? And that's if their information's correct. Maybe they have everything that this credit bureau had. So, you know, people, it's if they got your name, your social security number, and your date of birth, they can open up credit cards in your name. It's really quite easy. I mean, after all, all you do is you uh, put in a change of address with the post office and then you know, notify the bank and then apply for credit cards and say, oh, I'm John Doe. I was born January 1, 1960. My social security number is 666666666, right? Next thing you know, you get credit cards in the mail, open up bank accounts, whatever. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, you get a bunch of bills. Or you don't get bills because they changed your address. They've been uh, filing false tax returns with the IRS, getting your tax returns. You know, people file their taxes late, and then they find out, well, gee, you've already, we've already given you your refund. So, you know, and that's the thing. Uh, doctor's offices, they caught some people working for doctor's offices. Not one, but several, a number of them, not several, many of them, where the uh, people that were working in the doctor's office just grabbed your information because the doctor wants your name, date of birth, social security number. Do you know that when I got my social security card in 19, early, early 1970s, around 71, 72, uh, I think I, I got one when I think I was 16 years old because I got a job in high school working at a restaurant. And, of course, you got to have a Social Security number. Government's got to take money from you called taxes, right? Well, on the credit card that I had, it had this printed. It said, not, N-O-T, not for identification purposes. You see, when the government created the Social Security program, they promised everybody, this is not going to be used for an identification. This is not going to be used for identification. Liar, liar, pants on fire. And that'll probably happen if, uh, if you believe the Bible in the lake of fire. You know, Jesus throws them. Never mind. But, um, you know, but now... You go apply for a job, guess what? You don't give a job, you say, well, I'm not giving you my social security number. And they say, well, fine, 
we're not giving you the job that we offered you. You're not going to work here. You must give us your social security number. And, uh, and it was supposed to be voluntary. And it was only supposed to be the, the wealthy that paid social security. Uh, you know, and what kills me is they had people from Cuba that were in their late 60s that came to the United States, had never paid a penny into the program, and yet they gave them Social Security benefits. Now, how does that work? When my um, sister-in-law, who'd worked for eight or nine years, had kidney failure and couldn't work, was sick as anything, uh, they said, oh, well, you can't get Social Security because you haven't been working for 10 years. Really? So Cubans can come here that never paid a dime into the program. They can get Social Security. But an American citizen that gets sick, oh, well, you haven't worked 10 years, so you don't get it. Well, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I, you know, what can I tell you? But the thing is, the, the, I, it was not. This was not supposed to be used for identification, but now when you go to a doctor's office, they demand your social security number. When you go to the bank to open up an account, oh well, you got to give us your social security number. But of course, Bank of America is happy to open up checking accounts for illegal Mexicans that are here illegally, as long as they've got Mexican identification. They don't need a social security number. So basically they're playing us. And, you know, it's amazing. You can cross the border from Mexico and the United States and you don't need, you know, there's no, they just cross it illegally. And when I go to the airport, American citizen, never been in any serious trouble, I got to take my shoes off by, and get molested by the TSA. What's up with that? So, you know, and, and when you go to the driver's license, oh, well, we got to have your birth certificate. We got to have your social security card. We got to have identification. We got to have picture IDs. We got to have your firstborn uh, child. I mean, really? You know, but the Mexicans can just walk across the border and the courts say that it, uh, it's racial profiling if the police stop somebody that doesn't speak English, uh, but that's racial profiling and that's illegal. But I got to take my shoes off at the airport and get molested by the TSA. Oh, what can I tell you? But enough of my ranting on immigration. But my point is 40%, according to the article that I read in the, in the news, about 40% of the United States had their personal information, their credit information, stolen from one of the three major credit bureaus. And, you know, that's your name, address, social security number, date of birth, the whole deal, right? Mother's maiden name, the whole deal, right? So, you know, how do we prevent that? Now, the wicked government, well, I should say the wicked that run our government, they always have a solution and then create a problem. Now, what do you mean, Bob? What's up with that? I don't get it. Come on, what's up? Well, you know, the thing is, they want to do what they're doing in Sweden. Sweden is going to a cashless society. After all, if the government didn't have any cash and everybody was put their information, you know, there it was all computer information. I mean, after all, look at all the big thing they're doing about Bitcoin. You know, uh, you know, they they want to go no cash. After all the government will get their pound of flesh for their taxes if every transaction was recorded, right? And you, well, let's face it, the, you know, no more tax evasion, right? Sounds like a good thing, right? 
But the thing is, like in Sweden and certain companies in the U.S., they've been microchipping people. So, and people say, well, you know, maybe that's a good idea. I mean, after all, I could get a credit card in your name if I had your personal information. But how can you, if everybody had a personal microchip with all your personal information in it, and you scan the microchip at a scanner at the supermarket or Neiman Marcus or the gas station or the bank. I mean, how do you do identity theft that way? You know, are you going to cut off somebody's hand and take it to the supermarket? Really? You know, the bank might get suspicious if you uh, was holding a hand and, you know, you had two hands and an extra hand. You know, the bank might get suspicious and call the police, right? So, sounds like a good solution to identity theft, doesn't it? Well, could be. But um, doesn't the Bible mention something about the mark of the beast? Not being able to buy or sell, except he that had the, the number and the name of the, the beast, you know, 666. I mean, even people that don't believe the Bible have heard of that, 666. Well, suppose they put the number 666 into computer code into the chip. Now, I first read about these microchips back around 1990 or 1991. There was an article in the Palm Beach Post about a uh, veterinarian named Dr. Kunz, K-U-N-Z. And um, he was microchipping dogs. My uh, late father, he uh, liked to rescue, do rescue dogs. He was a dog lover. And uh, we rescued a German Shepherd. And we thought, this is strange. You know, every time a plane or a, a helicopter would go over, uh, we live close to the flight path of a small local airport at the time. And they had a helicopter training program there. So there was a lot of times we'd, you know, be small planes and small, heli uh, you know, those little helicopters. And they'd fly over. And this dog, every time they would fly over, this dog would look up in the air and watch at, at the helicopters and the airplanes with what looked like to me fear in its eyes. Dog did not like Fireworks, did not like loud noises. I mean, was lightning it. The dog would crawl into the tub in the bathroom. Well, Dad took the dog to the vet. The vet took his microchip scanner, scanned the dog. He says, you know what? Uh, this dog has a microchip, but I can't read it. And, you know, my dad's like, what do you mean you can't read it? I mean, you could tell it's got a chip. And he goes, oh, absolutely, this dog has a chip. But I can't read the information from it. And the vet said, this dog is military. The military uses a proprietary chip with that the civilian scanners cannot read. There's only a certain number of companies that make chips. And uh, I think Digital Angel's one of them. I, I, you could look it up. Um, but the, the veterinarian can read all the civilian chips for the dogs. He's got a scanner that can read all of them. Gives you the owner's name, medical information, health history of the dog, you know, when the had its rabies shots, the whole deal, right? So the, the dog was military. You know, so obviously this dog saw some action. Saw planes going overhead, dropping bombs. I mean, it, it makes sense. Well, in Sweden, they're starting to do, they're starting to chip people. And they're starting to chip people here in the United States at certain companies. They're using it for uh, the electronic doors uh, and various other things. But Sweden's going to a cashless society, and they're using these chips for financial transactions and identification. I mean, after all, who needs a passport when all your information is encrypted into a special chip and 
only people with the scanners can read them. Until, of course, the scammers get scanners. Uh, you know, I found it very interesting that um, the companies, for example, you know, uh, people get radar detectors for their cars so that they, you know, don't get caught speeding. Well, guess who makes the radar detectors? Well, the same companies that make the radars for the police. Isn't that interesting? Yes, we make radar for the police, and we're going to make radar detectors for the people the police are trying to catch speeding. You know, that's like uh, you have a war, and then you're selling guns to both sides, right? You clean up. I mean, you make a lot of money. And uh, then you're hosting the peace talks between the two countries that are fighting, right? You know, so uh, it's a scam. It's a scam. So, you know, uh, you create a problem, identity theft, and let's face it, people. Oh, the IRS has had breaches too. They've, they've, people have lost their uh, financial information from the government. You know, if your information's not secure, well, guess what? We got a solution. Everybody's going to have to get a microchip. No more cash. Uh, and if you don't get the microchip with your social security number, your date of birth, name, address, children's names, whatever, you cannot buy and you cannot sell. All right, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 13. I guess we'll go to start with verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Hmm, the image of the beast that speaks. Every time I read these, uh, these ver uh, verses, I think of television. The image of the beast. But that's just my opinion. Verse 16, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, that's me, free and bond, not the rich part, the poor part, uh, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. What do you want to bet that when the government mandates you got to get a chip if that's what they do, if that's what it ends up being, that it's going to end up in your right hand or in your forehead. What do you want to make a bet? Now, I'm not really a betting man. Um, I went to Las Vegas once, played the nickel slot machine, because I didn't really have any money. I just wanted to be able to say that, yeah, I went to Vegas and played the slots, you know. Walked in with a pocket full of nickels, walked out with a pocket full of nickels. I guess I brought broke even, I don't know. But actually, I went there because it was uh, like 112 degrees that day. It was summer. And uh, it was hot. And a uh, buddy I was with, we were joking around, you know, it was hot enough to fry an egg on the sidewalk. Well, guess what? He went to 7-Eleven, bought six eggs, cracked open an egg, put it on the sidewalk, and it fried. I was like, whoa, dude. Yeah, it was hot. 
so we went into the casino and got the uh, the uh, buffet breakfast or whatever, you know, got the steak dinner. Boy, I tell you what, when you get a prime rib dinner for 10 bucks, that's a deal. And it was good, too. Prime rib, man. Prime rib and filet mignon. I don't know which I like better, but uh, yeah, I'm not vegetarian. Uh, so, but what do you want to bet? Right hand or in the forehead? Hey, you want to put it in my left hand? I'll take the mark. I'll take a chip. Put it in my left hand if, if I'm required to, to, you know, get my social security or, you know, get my paycheck or whatever, you know. Verse 16, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let he that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. So that's six hundred sixty and six. Why is it the number of a man? Well, because Adam, man, was created on the sixth day. And then on the seventh day, the Lord rested. At least that's my opinion. So, create a problem, identity theft. You know, social security numbers were never to be, well, they were told, the, you know, politicians. You know, you could tell they're lying when their lips are moving, you know. Let's face it. What's the difference between a Democrat and a Republican? Well, it's like two, uh, uh, a coin, you know. Heads they win and tails you lose. It's, they're two sides of the same coin. You know, they, they say one thing before the election and then they do the exact opposite after. Oh yeah, we're going to lower taxes. They raise taxes. We're going to help the people. They enrich big corporations. Oh, you know, that's, that's politicians. I don't care if the Democrats or Republicans, they're basically the same. And believe me, I've been watching politics since uh, Richard Nixon. You're talking the 70s. It's always the same people. Always the same. I'm in my 60s now. I've seen a lot of elections come and I've seen a lot of elections go and they're always the same. So Social Security was told that we were Never going to have to use it for identification. Well, guess what? They lied. And what do you want to guess they're, they're going to do this? Identity theft. Yeah, you're, everybody's going to have to get a chip on their right hand or in their forehead, or they're not going to be able to buy, they're not going to be able to sell, no government benefits. And they call Social Security entitlements. Or, uh, you know, like, you know, they've been taking money out of my check to fund Social Security for basically last 45-something years, 45-plus, whatever. And then they act like they're giving me something when they're finally going to give it to me. You know, it's like, oh, well, we're doing you a favor. Really? You guys have been extorting money from me since, since I was 16 years old. And then when I finally get old enough to, to collect, you... You act like you're doing me a favor, please. All right, so, but that's not the only thing. Now, if you're Christian and you believe the Bible, I do, the King James, anyways, um, I strongly recommend that when it comes time to get a chip, hold out your left hand and say, here you go, put it on. But I guarantee you, it's not going to be in your right hand, or your left hand. It's going to be in your right hand. They're going to demand, no, 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 that's the wrong hand. 
sort of like when you're at a wedding and you're getting married and, you know, you stick out the wrong hand to put the wedding ring on and, you know, the, the wife will always point out, oh, no, 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 it goes on the other hand. Yeah, yeah that hand means, the ring on that hand means you're single. This one, this hand, ring on this hand means you're married. It takes a lot to get slipped by the girls, you know. Yeah, I used to perform weddings. That's why I know that. Guys would always stick out the wrong hand. The girls would always correct them. They know. But uh, it'll be the same thing. You watch. Mark my words. Well, don't mark my words. Mark the words of the Word of God. You know, Revelation 13. But what, uh, is this the only thing about identity theft? I mean, really? You know, uh, how do you solve the problem of uh, identity theft? Hey, microchip would work, right? Now, I'm not saying the microchip is the mark of the beast 100%, because honestly, I don't know. But it seems a logical choice. I mean, after all, there's, they're actually uh, starting to chip humans. But what's the other identity theft? Well, let's take a look. There's more to identity theft. Did you know that there's identity theft in the Bible? Yes, there is. And I'm going to read it to you right now. Let's check it out. All right. First thing I want to do is read to you the Bible definition of an antichrist. Now, in the Bible, they talk about the beast. Uh, others, they call the man of sin, the son of perdition. Others use the word antichrist. I believe they're all speaking of the same entity. But let's take a look at the Bible definition of an antichrist. And to do that, you have to go to first, the first book of John, chapter 2, verse 22. We read, who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So if you deny that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah, you're a liar. You are Antichrist. You're not only denying the Son, but you're denying the Father that sent the Son. What group of people deny that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah? Simple. They're called Jews. Don't believe me? Call the local synagogue and ask the rabbi. Hey, Rabbi, is Jesus the Christ? Is Jesus the Messiah of Israel? And he'll say, uh, no, absolutely not. Because, let's face it, people, if, if he thought, if the rabbi thought that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, wouldn't he be following the words of Jesus? Wouldn't he be listening to what Jesus said? Wouldn't he be a follower of Jesus? Wouldn't that make him a Christian? Absolutely. So, and yes, I know that there's people that, you know, they claim to be Messianic Jews. But um, they don't usually call him Jesus. They call him Yeshua. And, you know, being that my New Testament was written in Greek, which they'll deny that, um, the word Yeshua doesn't appear in the New Testament Greek anywhere. So, uh, why should I believe you know, Jesus, you know, my Bible says, and they shall call his name Jesus, the angel in Matthew, in Matthew chapter one, said, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. It doesn't say, and thou shalt call his name Yeshua or Yahashua or, you know, so are, are they worshiping a different? Is, that, is Yeshua a different Christ, a different Messiah? I don't know. We'll find out one day. But 
But if you deny that Jesus is the Christ, you're a liar, you're an antichrist, you're de you deny the Son, you're also denying the Father that sent the Son. And you've heard churches say, well, you know, the Jews don't have the Son, but they got the Father. Well, 1 John 2.23 says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not, not, N-O-T, not, the Father. You deny the Son, you deny the Father that sent the Son. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. All right, so. Now, I ask you a question. How can Jews that are Antichrist be God's chosen people? Does that make any sense to you? It doesn't to me. Well, let's take a look at a few other things. How about Galatians 3.29? The Bible, Paul writes, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Did you know God made a promise to Abraham? You know, Abraham didn't walk up to God, tap him on the shoulder and said, you know, God, if you bless me, I'm going to follow you. No. God went to Abraham and said, I'm going to bless you. Abraham was called the friend of God. Did you know that? How's that for a testimony? God chose Abraham. Abraham had two sons. He had Ishmael by a woman, an Egyptian woman named Hagar. And Ishmael, the Arabs claimed to be descended from Ishmael. But God rejected Ishmael from being the chosen seed. And God said, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And that was from his wife, Sarah. Sarah was 90 years old. How many 90-year-old women get pregnant and have children? Not many. Matter of fact, she might have been the only one. Well, after the flood. You know, when you, when you got people living seven, eight, nine hundred years before the flood, you know, 90 is like, you know, probably like being 12 years old, right? Uh, so, and then Isaac, who was Abraham's promised seed, according to God, because God rejected Ishmael to being the promised seed. Now, God blessed Ishmael for Abraham's sake, because Abraham loved Ishmael, but God said, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And then Isaac had two sons. Isaac had Jacob, Israel. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And he also had a son named Esau. And guess what? God rejected Esau. And of course, the people that call themselves black Hebrews say that all white people are Esau, that God hated. Read it, Malachi chapter 1. God said, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. And you white people are Esau. God hates you. Well, you know, Jacob and Esau were twins. Have you ever seen twins, two different colors, one black and one white? Uh, personally, I never have. I've read about it. It's not a very common thing. Well, you white people, you're a bunch of albinos. Uh, okay. Well, if you want to know what Jesus looked like, you could read John in the book of Revelation, read chapter, Revelation chapter 1. It gives a description of what John saw with Jesus. And it doesn't say he was black. Why is it why is it why is it that anybody except for white people can be God's chosen people? Jews can be chosen people, Mexicans, the Browns, the Hispanics can be God's chosen people, the American Indians. Uh, according to the Mormons, are the chosen people. Um, the Antichrist Jews can be God's chosen people, according to 99% of the churches today. 
the blacks are God's chosen people, but when you say white people, the people that have built the churches, the people that printed the Bibles, the people that took sent missionaries all over the world and spread the gospel, when you say those are the people, God's chosen people, the Christians, oh no, that's that's racist. Oh, that's evil. You're a white supremacist. You're a Nazi. Really? I didn't know that. Thanks for pointing it out to me. You know, in Matthew 15, 24, Jesus said, But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Huh. Well, what people have... What, what race of people have responded to the gospel? The Chinese? No. The Japanese? No. India? Absolutely not. Um, Central Black Africa? No. They never responded to uh, the, the gospel. When has Africa ever built churches and printed Bibles and sent missionaries into the world? I mean, never. You know, in Galatians 3.29, it says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. But who was Abraham? In Genesis 17.5, God said, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many, many nations have I made thee. Many is not all. So if the Jews are all of Abraham, and we're just a bunch of non-Gentiles, well, then where are all these many Jewish nations? Where are they? And by the way, one little Jewish nation in the Middle East is not many. One is not many. If you think one is many, I'll give you one dollar and whatever. I mean, come on. One is not many. Unless you got a million dollars. But, so, there's only one nation, and it, was, and it was created by the United Nations. And one is not many. So either God lied, which is impossible, or the Jews are not all of Israel, or we were lied to. Okay. Did you know that God divorced Israel? In Jeremiah 3.8, we read, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, and that's spiritual adultery, whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Do you know what a bill of divorce is? God divorced Israel. Let's continue reading. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. What's a harlot? Uh, a whore. So God divorced Israel. But God promised Abraham he would be the father of many nations. In Genesis 17, and verse 5, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Many nations. Okay? And like I said, Matthew 15, 24, Jesus said, But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why were they lost? They were divorced. In John 10, 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Do the Chinese follow Christ? No. What about the Japanese? No. The, uh, the Hindu Indians in India? No. Central Black Africa? Do they follow Christ? No. Absolutely not. What group of people have followed Christ? Christ. The Western nations, you know, the ones with the highest standard of living, the one where all the 
the blacks and the browns and the the Asian people that, that all want to come to the white countries. Have you noticed that? Everybody wants to come to America and Europe. Why is that? Why don't you have white people going to Africa or Mexico or, or China? Let's face it. Everybody wants to live in, in the Europe or America. Huh. Doesn't that make you wonder? Now remember, God divorced Israel. In the book of Hosea, chapter 1, verse 10, we read, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place, and that's Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people. Remember, God divorced Israel. Ye are not my people. There it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Now, how does that work? Well, when we come to Christ and ha have faith and are born again of the Holy Spirit, we become the sons of God. Now ask yourself this, do the Jews fulfill this prophecy? Absolutely not. Jews are antichrist. They don't believe in Jesus. Have you ever read this book of Hosea? Very few have. And preachers, your average demon-nominational preacher doesn't dare touch it. How about verse cha Hosea chapter 2, verse 23? And I will sow her, who's her? Israel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Well, who were the people that were not his people? Jeremiah 3.28, God divorced Israel. He says, they were his people, and then he divorced them. They were not his people anymore. Remember, Jesus said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know, the people that God divorced. Well, Hosea 2.23, And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. How about Romans 9.28? Paul's writing to the Romans. He's not writing to the Jews. He's writing to the Romans, who are supposed to be a bunch of Gentiles, right? As he saith also in Osi, which is the Greek rendering of the word Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. Who was God's beloved? Israel was. Romans 9, 26. And it, is, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. And where was the place? Jerusalem. See, Paul is quoting Old Testament prophecy for Israel in the book of Romans. So were some of these Romans divorced Israel? Hmm. Matthew 15, 24. But he, Jesus, answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost, or divorced, sheep of the house of Israel. Well, boy, that's, you know, who are, who are Israelites? But haven't we been told, well, it's only, only Jews are Israel, right? Well, Paul writes in the book of Titus, chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, Paul writes, not giving heed. What does it mean to heed? It means to pay attention, listen to. Not giving heed to Jewish fables. What's a fable? It's a story. You ever heard of uh, Aesop's table, fables? You know, uh, you know, they're fairy tales. A fable is a fairy tale. Not, and not giving heed to Jewish fables. 
and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So we're not supposed to listen to Jewish fables. You know, they're, they're the only ones that are God's chosen people. Huh. So who are God's chosen people? Identity theft, right? John chapter 10, verse 23. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. So here it is. Jesus in, is in the temple. He's on Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. So here it is. The Jews gather around Jesus and they're saying, You know, how, how long are you making us to doubt? I mean, come on. If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly that, you know, come on, just spit it out. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Now, I ask you a question. Were they not of his sheep because they didn't believe? Or did they not believe because they were not of his sheep? See, you know, it, it's amazing. You get people called free will Baptists, and they says anybody can be saved. All you got to do is believe in Jesus. God doesn't have a chosen people unless they're Jews. You see, they will fight you and say, you know, uh, no, 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 no. We don't believe in election. We don't believe in a chosen people, except for the Jews who are Antichrist and don't believe Jesus. But those are the chosen people. Jesus said they were not of his sheep. The Bible says they're Antichrist. And those are God's chosen people? Really? Does that make any sense to you? It doesn't make any sense to me. You see, Christians are not, not, not allowed to be God's chosen people. Oh, that's racist. That's horrible. That's Calvinism. Tulip. Ooh, that's a heresy. And God forbid you preach obedience to the gospel and God's laws. Oh, that's lordship salvation. That's that's a heresy. You're you're trying to earn your salvation. Really? So the Ten Commandments are optional. I can believe in Jesus and kill people, commit adultery, steal stuff from my neighbor, and I'm saved. Be a hitman for the mafia, and I'm saved. I hear being a hitman for the mafia pays pretty good money. I hear people get ten thousand dollars a hit. Hey, I can make a lot of money doing that, right? Just believe in Jesus and go to heaven, right? Obedience is optional. And repentance, that's another dirty word. Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Repent of what? Your unbelief? Really? So we're not supposed to turn away from our sin and be obedient? You know, obedient? Well... Let's go back to John 10. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Ah, my sheep hear my voice. Do you hear the voice of Jesus when you read the Bible? Then you're his sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them, out of my hand. Wow. So why can't Christians be God's chosen people? Why not? Why can't they? And another thing, why is repentance, uh, you know, why are they telling people that repentance and turning from sin 
is not the intention of the Bible. They're saying all you got to do is repent of your unbelief. You can continue sinning, uh, but you got to repent of your unbelief. Well, let's, you know, repent of what? Are we supposed to repent of our unbelief or repent of sin? Well, turn to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. Unto the church, uh, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So here it is, they're talking to a church. Now, I'll guarantee you the people in the church believe. I mean, let's face it, if you don't believe, you're not part of the church, right? Period. If you believe, you're part of the church. And the church is where two or three gather in the name of Jesus, not a corporate entity uh, with the name First Baptist Church on the corner of First and Main. That's a business. That's a corporation incorporated by the state. Verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how that and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And hast and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. And hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Revelation 2, 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. What? Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. God's speaking to the church here. So the believing church is supposed to repent of what? Their unbelief? But they're the church. They believe. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Do the first works. Do what you did in the beginning when you first got saved and loved the Lord. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now, how in the world does a church, a believing church, repent of their unbelief? Obviously, they're talking about repenting of our works that are not completely righteous before God. The Bible says that without holiness, we won't see God. Did you know that? All right. So let's take a look. You know, in Matthew 121, my Bible says, and she, who she, Mary, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And then in Acts 4.12, Paul Peter writes, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. You ever wonder why they hate the name of Jesus? Oh yeah. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 6. You know, reading the Old Testament is considered heresy among so-called New Testament Christian churches because they don't want to read they don't want you to read things that proves their doctrines wrong verse 6 deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 6 do ye thus requite the lord o foolish people and unwise is not he the father that hath bought thee hath he not made thee and established thee remember the days of old consider the years of many generations Ask of thy father, and he will show thee, thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam. See, the Most High God divided the nations their inheritance, 
and he separated the sons of Adam. He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Huh. See, God separated the nations. Who is it that wants to mix everybody up? The United Nations, the European Union, Washington, D.C. They want every third world country to come to the white, western, formerly Christian nations. Isn't that the truth? Oh, yeah. God separated them, and the world wants to mix us all together. Identity theft. Take a look at the Song of Solomon. It's a Bible book, chapter 5, verse 10. Solomon's describing the bride. Who is the bride? Uh, the bride of Christ is Israel, people. Remember, in Jeremiah 3, verse 8, God divorced Israel. Well, they're going to be remarried at the marriage supper of the Lamb, those in faith who are born again of the Spirit. Song of Solomon 5, verse 10, is a description of the bride. My beloved is white, W-H-I-T-E. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. Ruddy, ruddy means reddish. You ever heard of women putting rouge or blush on their cheeks? You know? Oh, yeah. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. How about the book of Lamentations, verse four, chapter 4 and verse 7? Remember Jesus was, remember Jesus of Nazareth? And then you had Samson, who was a Nazarene, had the vow of the Nazarenes. There's people tell me that Nazareth and Nazarenes are different. I'm not so sure. They could be. I mean, I'm not an expert on everything. But Lamentations 4, 7. And the Nazarites were most certainly Israel. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. What color is snow? Um, white? Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. Now, unless you put Hershey's chocolate into milk, it's, it's milk's white, right? Then it becomes chocolate milk, but sort of like interracial marriage, right? Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. If you don't know it, rubies are red. So, why, uh, you know, think about it. Why the unlimited third world immigration into the USA and Europe? Who printed the Bibles and built all the churches? Did Africa? No. Asia? No. Europe and the United States did. So, what about identity theft? Well, how about Revelation chapter 2, verse 9? Jesus said, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Remember, Jesus said, But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and no man can pluck them out of my hand. I, I think I'm paraphrasing there, but... So why can't Christians be God's chosen people? Why not? I mean, think about it. Most churches... Or corporations corp incorporated their business by the state incorporated by the state to be tax exempt the buildings have a mortgage God said 
not to owe man anything but love. So right there, they disobeyed God by getting a mortgage on the building. And who owns the building's mortgage? The bank. And who owns the banks? Who were the money changers in God's in uh, the days of Christ? Who were in the temple changing the money? Oh, you can't use that Roman coin to to, to pay your tithe. Here, I'll, but I'll exchange it here. I'll, I'll exchange it for here. This is holy money. That Roman money is not holy, but I'll, I'll exchange it for this. What did Jesus do to the money changers? He overthrew their tables and took a whip of cords and whipped them. What would Jesus do? Uh, taking a whip of cords and whip beating people is not beyond the realm of possibilities. I love that. I, I really do. But um, who owns the banks that own the mortgage on the church? The Bible says that if the, the borrower is the slave or servant to the lender. Maybe that's why they teach the owners of the banks are God's chosen people and could do no wrong. Maybe that's why they teach this garbage, right? So, all right, well, identity theft, people. Identity theft. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world, in Jesus' precious name, amen.